And now, Dean Forgio, what a spoken word piece. <clears throat> it's all right. There comes a time. Got no patience to search. For peace of mind, laying low. Want to take it slow. No more hiding or disguising truths I've sold. Every day it's something hits me, all so cold. Find me sitting by myself, no excuses, then I know. Episode number 29 of The Performers I Know. Special guest, Mike Schiavo, coming at you. These are the performers I know. These are the performers I know. I know. These are the performers I know. These are the performers I know. I know. These are the performers I know. These are the performers I know. I know. These are the performers I know. All right, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. It's time for another fun-filled episode of The Performers I Know. This is episode number 29. This week, my guest is from Staten Island, and you know what that means. <laughs> this is actually, I believe, only the second person that I have interviewed who comes from Staten Island. Dory Aspinwall was the first. Uh, he is a actor, a director. He has a podcast as well because everybody has a podcast nowadays. Yeah, he's also a filmmaker, and he is here. My guest is Mike Schiavo. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dean. Happy to be here. I'm glad to have you here. So, once upon a time, about two years ago. I first saw Mike in a production at the Little Victory Theater and a little show called In Over the River and Through the Woods. Yeah. Very, very fun show. Very, very funny show. Yeah, that, that show had a uh, had, had a bunch of uh, ups and downs to it. It was really interesting to be a part of that show. And we can we can talk about that in just a few minutes. But um I never actually worked with Mike until just this past March, where he directed me in Murder on the Orient Express, where I played Poirot, the detective. And that was a lot of fun. It was quite exhausting, especially having to wear that phony baloney mustache and speak yeah. a French accent all the time. But uh, we all got through it, and it was a lot of fun. But uh, Mike, my, my first question to you, as I ask all of my guests, what got you bitten by the, well, not just the acting bug, but the performance, uh, directing, writing, filmmaking, just performing arts in general bug? Um, honestly, what got me into it was a buddy of mine back in high school. Uh, I went to St. Peter's, which is an old boys school, and coming from eight years of public school, I really didn't want to make the switch to a Catholic school, let alone an old boys Catholic school. So my freshman year, I tried out for the baseball team, didn't make it. And I was all upset. And a buddy of mine the following year was like, dude, try out for the uh, play, you know. And I'm like, all right, whatever. That, and that's where the girls are. Yeah, that he goes, he goes, there's tricks there from St. Peter's girls in Notre Dame. I was like, I'm sold. And... <laughs> I, I tried out. It was uh, South Pacific. I got uh, the role of the professor, and it kind of all went downhill from there. I was like, hey, this is kind of fun. Uh, you know, it, it, and from that, I just got bit. I Who, did. Uh, you were the professor. Who played Gilligan? Yeah. <laughs> no, nah, I don't know. There was no Gilligan in that one, but uh, no, that was my character's name, and um. Yeah, it's all downhill from there, and uh, I've been doing it pretty much ever since. I took a a little break 
And then I got into it again when I was at CSI. And from that, I just kind of kept doing it. You know, when I spoke, when I talked to Dory Asman Wall, she really kind of painted this very interesting picture of the uh, theater scene, on at least on Staten Island in like the 80s and 90s. So it's always interesting to be able to uh, get people's perspectives on that. Um, so you kind of were in sort of like the 90s uh, doing all that stuff. Would you say it was profoundly different uh, doing theater back then as it is now, or was is it kind of like the same? Um, I'm guessing it, it's kind of like the same. Like when I, when I started in, like I was in high school and the, I graduated in 96 and um, I did it, you know, primarily just, in high school and then I did one sh I did a couple of shows at CSI one of which like the only one I really auditioned for called the uh, Mandrake but um the other two shows that I was in at CSI was part of uh, acting classes that I took so um you know really wasn't too much of auditioning for that one but uh I feel it's like, you know, it's all pretty much the same, you know, happen to be right place at the right time. And, you know, it, it's who, you know. Well, yeah, that is true. And it, it's sometimes it is who, you know, I, I, I sometimes tell this story to people, but uh, when I joined the Staten Island Academy of Performing Arts, which is not a school, but it was an acting group. Uh, the first show they did was Damn Yankees. And it was quite literally the easiest audition ever. It went, a little, it went a little something like this. Hey, we need somebody to play Applegate. Do you want to do that? Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. You got the part. Well, nice. Oh, hey, how about that? Oh, 15 years old, playing the devil. I don't, know what they were, I don't know what they were trying to get at, but there, there we go. So, uh, yes, you... Um, so you primarily focus a lot on filmmaking is my understanding yeah i mean i do um you know i like film yeah i think it's uh, a little it's definitely more forgiving than doing uh live theater um mm -hmm. i get to have a little more it's a little more fun doing a film because um you know there's more to figure out in like terms of how do we you know get these locations how do we get these shots um you know you, you have to macgyver a few things here and there especially if you're shooting on a low to no budget um so it, it's it's a little more creativity which is a little more challenging and i find it to be a little more fun now do you do you stay primarily local or do you go to like exotic locales like new jersey um I did a couple of music videos in Jersey, but uh, the majority of my work has been on the island. And uh, what do you uh, do? You primarily focus on one type of genre, or do you do you run the gamut of different ones? Because like I know some people just like to do horror movies, some people like to do comedies and whatnot. Would you? What would you no. say is your? Uh... I kind of I kind of run the gambit. I've written a couple of sci-fi films. I've written a couple of comedies. Um, I've written a couple of suspense. You know, it just you know I I did a little uh, into like the uh, rom com, but you know, whatever idea popped into my head, I just like okay, how do I run with this? And like I don't sit down and say okay, I want to write a horror film. I want to write. A comedy film i just sit down i have this idea and as i'm writing it just kind of comes out and and goes from what, there what if you can actually find parking at the staten island mall yeah right yeah oh what if two people meet at the staten island mall yeah while, well, while looking for parking well that's it you know what we're gonna win an oscar for sure for that one there you Absolutely. go so uh yes you um you were mentioning that over the river and through the woods had a very interesting uh up yeah, and down 
Rose Actually, there's said. someone's at my uh, front door. Can I can I put this in hold for like two seconds? Yeah, sure. All right. Sorry, I'll be right back. No problem. Well, wow, this is uh this is unprecedented, folks. We've never had somebody who actually had to uh go and go to the front door. Hi folks, future Dane here. Yeah, he did in fact have to go to the front door. He was gone for several minutes. Uh yeah. So we pick up the episode after Mike came back from going to the front door to see who was there. So you were mentioning that uh, there was a lot of ups and downs with uh, Over the River and Through the Woods yes. um, with the very lovely Alberta Thompson at the Little Victory Theater. Are you able to divulge what exactly was the ups and downs? Yeah. Um, well, first off, uh, one of the challenges was it was around COVID. It was it was during COVID time. So this is when everything was just starting to uh, open up again. So we couldn't have uh, a full house. So, you know, we, we kind of had to limit the number of uh, seats we can open up. So that was a little challenging. And then um, one of the characters we had, we actually, we, we did the show. And people were asking, you know, if we can extend the run. And we extended it by another two weeks. And one of the uh, female leads, she ended up, uh, the woman who was originally casted, uh, Courtney Emerson, very talented actress. She played uh, my, the, the woman that my grandparents in the show tried to hook me up with. She was it in, she was the, uh, the she had the role in the first run. And then when we extended it, she couldn't make it for the other one. So we brought in uh, Victoria Gullo. So she, <laughs> I had a different girlfriend in the second run, but then she couldn't make the third run. So we brought in uh, Tamara Lencher for the third and final run. So that was interesting seeing how these two new actresses basically just got thrown into the uh, fire. And we're like, okay, you have a week. Here are your lines. Good luck. So we kind of made up uh, cheat sheets for Victoria, where uh, we had it taped. We had like a big dinner scene. So we had her lines uh, taped to her plate. And we did, uh, we had part of the set made up to be like a living room. So we had uh, some of her lines taped on the back of a pillow in case she needed a, a little cheat sheet. And then during one matinee, there was a um, fire down the street from the Little Victory, which knocked out a Transformer. And in the middle of the biggest scene in the show, we lost power. The entire theater went dark. And we were like, um, okay. And, you know, we just played along. We were like, Grandma, didn't you pay the electric bill? What's going on? And since it was like uh, summertime, I believe, you know, it, it, it was kind of hot. So we had no air conditioning and we were about to tell everybody, like, look, come back uh, the following week and we'll give you guys, you know, the show that you paid for. And they were like, no, 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 we want to see it now. And everybody took out their cell phones and flipped on their flashlights. And just as we were about to get going, the power came back on and the AC came back on, thank God. And um, we were able to uh, finish the show. But yeah, between having three different females for the same role and losing power and trying to figure out how to do it online. And uh, as we were coming back from COVID, it, it was definitely, definitely a show to, uh, to remember. You want to, you want to talk about things interrupting during very pivotal scenes. Uh, during the first weekend of Orient Express, yeah. I was surmising everything and we were, getting to who the killers were. Mm -hmm. I'm in the middle of one of my monologues and all of a sudden you just hear, wake up little Susie. Yes. And I'm just like, what is going on here? So it's like, okay. Gotta keep going. 
And as I keep going, the the music starts to get louder, <laughs> and I'm just like, "What, Lord? What what is going on here? Is this is this this is this is my nightmare? This is what's going." I, yeah. I apparently this person just decided to take out their cell phone, and that was their ringtone. And uh, yeah, I think Rose yeah. Gleesey, our intrepid stage manager, was like, "Shut the fuck up!" Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> We did a yeah. The, the the crowd sent a little Vic. Sometimes they get a little too into it. When we did over the river, one of the uh, characters that one of the people who played my grandfather, you know, later on to play, you know, I divulged that he uh, had passed of cancer. So as I'm giving this big dramatic monologue right towards the end of the play, I said, you know, my grandfather. I go, he, you know, a few weeks later, you know, he passed of cancer. And this one woman just starts laughing. And she's like, ha, 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 cancer, ha, ha, ha. And we all kind of looked at her. And we were like, what the hell is wrong with you? And that kind of, I mean, that that threw me for a little bit of a loop. I wasn't exactly expecting that. And we're all, I mean, she was like hysterical laughing. I'm like, um, okay. Yeah. yeah how, do, how, do, how do you find your moment now? I don't quite understand the. Uh, did, did she? Did she explain why she did that, or she? I guess she kind of just like hightailed it out of there after the show. Yeah, no, she she kind of did her chuckle, and then once she realized everybody was looking at her, she kind of like just sunk down into her seat, and um. Yeah, I I kind of feel like I, I as you should because that is. Yeah. A little, strange yeah she just kind of sunk down into the seat and we were like okay you know find the moment again keep on going looking over our shoulders like is she gonna do something again but Mm -hmm. then um you know at the end of the show i was like what the hell was that and uh yeah don't i just don't know but uh yes um but jumping back into your uh filmmaking career for just a moment is there any crowning achievements that you've had like any films that you can point at and say that is the best work i've ever done period uh well i wouldn't put a period on it right now because i'm still getting things going with my film career but as of right now i would have to say uh, a film i did about three years ago called the uh, fourth wall written by uh, greg Holmes, a good friend of mine um that has been winning some awards and uh been getting some traction and a lot of people you know whenever i submit it a lot of people like this is like really good so it's like it's always up for either uh you know best editing best acting uh it's been getting some notoriety can you give us a little summation of what it's about uh basically it's about a screenwriter when greg originally wrote it he wrote it for me Mm-hmm. And um, the, the story is about um, a screenwriter who's having an internal conflict with himself as to which way he wants a certain screenplay that he's writing to go. But the way Greg wrote it was uh, he wrote it in a way where he's having an internal conversation with himself, but you get to see what's going on. So you have one half of them. Where it's like, I want to make art. I want to, you know, I want to be the art thing. You know, I want to, you know, create art. And then you have the other side of him was like, no, 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 no. Let's make money. Let's go the Hollywood route. Let's give people what they want. And the way we shot, I shot it was I had one character playing two roles. And it was Mike, which is I want to do the art. And then I had other Mike, which was no, no, no. Let's go with the Hollywood style of it. And he's sitting next to himself on the couch, basically having an argument with himself as to which way he wants this film to go. And as he's having an argument with himself, you know, I cut in uh, little scenes from the film that he wants to make, you know, as as it's being uh, thought up in his head. You know, that's always the uh, that's always the conflict that I have with my. Uh with my plays as well it's you know is it 
do I want something that's going to make a lot of money at the box office or do I want something that is close to my heart um, in terms of art and whatnot? And I think the best example of that would be when I did Daniel, my brother. Mm -hmm. um, didn't really get a didn't really get a hot crowd, but the people that we did get really enjoyed it. And I truly appreciated and loved the piece as it was so i feel like that was a victory in itself so yes so remember yeah. remember when i said that mike has a podcast just like <laughs> everybody else does yeah oh boy the dragoons lair podcast, podcast along with you and uh serendipitous of this james hayes who i happen to know because i met james going to Warriors of Wrestling shows. And it's you and James and uh, Daniel Gaeta. Am I saying Gaeta, yeah. It's actually Gaeta, but it's actually Gaeta's show. Oh, okay. It's well. I'm I'm uh one of the co hosts on it. It started off with, you know, just Gaeta doing the show. And and I've I've known Dan for years, going back to CSI where we first met and we became friends because we kept trying to one up each other and like on our useless movie trivia. And then, you know, it went all downhill from there, but I, uh, it started out with just him talking about, you know, all entertainment stuff. And then he was like, I need a co-host. So he hits me up and he was like, all right, we're going to do this every Friday. You win. I'm like, yeah, let's go. And then, you know, it got switched to every other week, every other Friday we do it. And, um, you know, we just talk about, anything under the sun in the field of entertainment movies comic books cartoons uh wrestling we just kind of give our we throw our little two cents into the ring and um we brought james in a couple of maybe about um i don't know i'll say about maybe two three months ago uh, so he james didn't just wander in he invited him yeah, Danny invited him and he was like, okay, we need a third because, you know, just having two people going back and forth, we just kind of need another person like to bounce ideas off of and you know, just, just basically be a third. So, um, yeah, James came in and yeah, you know, we just talk about anything in the world of entertainment. Now, this is, this is uh, strictly off the record, but I I've heard from a, a reliable source that apparently there's something going on where they wanted you to dress up as Balky. Yeah. No. And has has that been brought to your attention, or did I just totally uh, just throw people under the bus just now? No, no, it's it, what they wanted to for years. Uh, people say I look like Bronson Pinchot, and I honestly I don't see it, and. You know, um I mean yeah, I, I I I don't see it either. I mean yeah, I, I I get where they're coming from, but it's like nah, not really. Yeah, I mean my they, they break my chops a lot about this. And um uh last November, I think it was, uh me, Lynn, Danny, and our friend Henry went to ChillerCon out in New Jersey and we actually met uh, Mark Lynn Baker, who played Cousin Larry. And I was like, you have to settle an argument for us. I go, Danny thinks that I look like Bronson Pinchot. I go, you work with the man. You know the man. I go, please settle this once and for all. I go, do I look like Bronson Pinchot? And he takes a second, takes a step back, looks me up and down, and he's like, yeah, no. So I was like, yes, had it from the man himself. I do not look like Bronson Pinchot, sorry. But uh, yeah, they, they always break my chops that like, oh, you have to go with Balky. I'm like, yeah, that's not happening. Oh, Cousin Larry, don't be ridiculous. Cousin Larry. Uh, Mr. Ahmed Foley. <laughs> oh, Foley. Get the fuck out of here. I no, I cannot. Out. I cannot get the fuck out of here. Yeah. What what you don't know is that uh, Mike went up to Marklin Baker and slipped him a 20 like, hey. Yeah, I did. I did. I, I, got, I got there. 
I was like, look, I go, someone's going to come up, just just play it off, say no. <laughs> well, um, it's not like I got anything going on right now. I, I can use the 20. So. Yeah, right? Mm-hmm. We actually asked him about uh, She-Hulk season two. We were like, what's going on? You know, it looked like it's coming back. And he's like, it doesn't look that way. So that, that kind of sucks. I didn't even know he was in there. So that's interesting. Yeah, he played um, he played uh, She-Hulk's father. Oh, well, there you go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, um, yes, act so Mike has done acting, he's done film, he has been in podcast, and but apparently, a frontier that he didn't explore until just recently with uh Murder on the Ori Express was directing a play. Now, I mean, I feel like I heard you say that this was the first time you ever directed a play, is that right? Yes, it was. It, this is the first time I ever, ever directed a uh, a play, so it was a little, a little different for me because I'm always like, "All right, cut, go back, let's try it again, and get it right." But then I was like, at the same time, you know, I was like, "Okay, we can't really just dwell on this one scene. We have to move on with the rest of the show." Unlike in film, where I could spend all day just doing one scene until we get it to the part where I say, okay, I like this and then come back the next day and do um, like another scene. So it, it was a little, little different and directing you know, a live play. You know, it's, it's a funny thing because it seems like a lot of the times where I audition for something and I have, I, I go in just for the fun of it. It's not like, Oh, I really want to get this role. Whenever I go in with little expectations, it, it turns out I should probably do that more often because I, you were just like, yeah, you're Poirot. There, there yeah. We as soon as you walked in, I was like, this is him. Because it, you had like, you, you just had the look that I was looking for when I, when I pictured Poirot in my head. I was like, okay, I want somebody who looks like Dane. All right. That's you, buddy. <laughs> hey, how about that? Yeah. Yep. You know, like so. I mean, how did um how did this come about that you got the, this directing position? Like, I, you know, I was I was doing um I was stage managing uh the last the show before Murder on the Orient Express. Uh, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but Alberta was like, "Look, you know, we're doing this." We're looking for a director. Would you be interested in directing? And I was like, what the hell? I haven't tried it before. Could be fun. And uh, I was like, yeah, I'll do it. And that was basically all she wrote. Now, are you involved in their current production of Lend Me a Soprano? Which, as we are recording this, it's the 23rd of April. And the show opens on the 26th? 26th. Yes, that's this Friday. Yeah. Um, yes and no. I, okay. when we were wrapping up Murder, Rose and Alberta at, walks up to me and they were like, you're auditioning for the show, right? And I was like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll audition, you know? And they're like, great. I was like, okay, you know? And I was still, I'm like, when's the show? And they told me, like, it told me the dates, but my mind was literally still running around doing stuff for murder i didn't remember on the on opening night i actually have a conflict i had bought tickets to a different show that i'm going with a group of people so i I auditioned for the show i get a, a i get a decent sized role and then rose sends out the um the schedule and i look at it and i'm like uh Oh, so I was like, Rose, I go, you two are going to kill me. I go, I can't be in the show because I have a conflict. And they were like, yeah, you're right. We're going to kill you. But um, the person I got to play the role filled in and he knocks it out of the park. But um, I'm looking at I'm I'm going to take a guess as to which of these four it is. Okay. I have a suspicion that it's the role that Albert Albanese has. <laughs> yes. Hey, all right. I got it. 
Yeah, I was like, and, but I ended up, I, I was still a part of it where I ended up building, uh, I built this set for them. Mm-hmm. So I, I came down, I gave them like three weeks, three and a half weeks, and three weeks and one major re redesign of the stage. Ah, so. Yeah, because now- it's supposed, it takes place in a hotel room. And they wanted a wall separating the stage. And I was like, but half the people are going to miss half the show. And like, no, 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 it'll look fine. It'll look fine. And I was like, okay. So I build the wall separating the two with a door like they asked for. And then they were like, people are going to miss half the show. I was like, really? I go, wow. I go, where where have you heard that one before? Yeah, I was going to say, I've heard, I've heard this one before. Stop yeah. Me you Stop me if you heard this. So I had to go back in and do some reconstruction but uh we we put it up and they came in they sent me a picture the other day and just like the way they dressed it holy cow it it, the set looks amazing the cast is amazing go out watch the show you're gonna laugh your end off i uh i i can't help but wonder because i know andres uh being sick is in the show and i had the pleasure of working with him on Murder on the Orient Express. He's playing like an Italian. Uh, does he does he do another accent like he did in uh, Murder? I I don't know if he's playing an Italian. I know he did an accent when he just got done doing a scene from the Staten Island Ferry. He played Dracula. Um, I'm not sure if he has an accent in this one, but I know he plays kind of like a goofy character that kind of gets... Um, kind of get like wrapped up in everything that's going on mm-hmm. so i don't want to give away too too much because i'm not exactly 100 percent sure of his character but no well i i think he plays a little bit of a uh, goofball but it, yeah, it should right. be fun to see him play that and of course we have the uh we have the every man um uh, the hardest working man on staten island of course i'm talking about eric rosen yes eric is great i love eric I, I actually want to have him as a guest very soon because he just, like I said, hardest working man. Every time I turn around, he's in another show. So yeah, yeah absolutely a craziness. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. But, um, I see by the old clock on the wall that we are starting to run out of time. Um, but Mike, my last question to you, as I ask all of my guests if somebody were to come up to you and say, hey, Mike, I want to do what you do. I want to, you know, whether it's acting or writing a screenplay or directing or jumping into a podcast, just performing in general, what would be the piece of advice that you would give them to best succeed in that endeavor? Uh, I would have to say, go for it. But make sure you have your thick skin on because you're going to get a lot of a lot of criticism, a lot of rejections and a lot of people just like, I don't get it. So go for it, but don't take everything to heart, you know, be open for some criticism, you know, follow the dreams, but. Also, be be ready for be ready for the criticism, because what makes sense to you might not make sense to everybody else, and you know you, you just got to be able to roll with the punches. That's what they say, and yep. that is very sound advice. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as our outro plays us out, I want to thank my very special guest, Mike Schaub. Well, Mike, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having me. Yep, and we will see all of you on the next episode. So long. Bye. These are the performers I know, I know. These are the performers I know. These are the performers I know, I know. These are the performers I know.